We want to welcome to our 930 Sunday Bible study taken for, uh, we're coming live, well, by video, I suppose, uh, from Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama, and we, we're, we're glad to have you uh, with us today by the internet. Uh, I want to, last week we, we, well, let me tell you where we've been in our series during the month of uh, April that we've done an Easter special uh, during the month. And what we did is we looked at the four holidays that Jesus of Old, Old Testament, the four Jewish holidays that Jesus had to fulfill in his first advent. There were seven major Jewish messianic Jewish holidays. And four of them deal with the first coming and three of them deal with the second coming. And what's interesting about the first four was we we're studying during our our, our Easter special during the month of April is how they're linked. For example, they begin at Passover, which was nice and 14, uh, 30 AD. That's a Wednesday. And then the very next day is the beginning of unleavened bread, which goes for seven days. It goes from the 15th to the 21st. These are days, not dates. Kind of like Christmas, you know. It's a date, not, not a day. And um, in the middle of that week, or after the first day, the first day after the weekly Sabbath of unleavened bread, is the first day of the week. We call it Sunday. That was first fruits. It was the festival of first fruits. So we have the festival of Passover, the festival of unleavened bread, seven days. Then we have in the middle of that. We have the Feast of Weeks, uh, the, the, fir, the First Fruits holiday, the First Fruits Feast. And then you start counting seven full Sabbath weeks to the 50th day, which we call in the Greek Pentecost, for the uh, Feast of Weeks. It's called Weeks for that, 50 days. And you have the, the festival called the, week, the Feast of Weeks. We call it Pentecost, uh, and that's, uh, a, that's Acts 2. So what we have is Jesus dies on Wednesday, Passover 14th of Nice. He's buried the 15th, 16th, and 17th. He's got to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, Matthew 12. On Sunday, the first day at, after the weekly Sabbath, you count 50 days to Pentecost. 40 of those days, he was in post-resurrection appearances uh, taken from the 24th chapter of Luke to the first chapter of Acts. I, I quote both those because Luke wrote them, volume one, Luke, volume two, Acts. Luke wrote them. Now, what's important for you to understand is that the first day and the last day of unleavened bread were holy days. There were holy convocations. John uh, 1931 calls them high Sabbaths because they were viewed just like you would a weekly Sabbath as far as rules and regulations. So this is really important. Now, Pentecost, you're going to count down 50 days to Pentecost, uh, the 50th day. That, too, is going to be a high Sabbath, a high Sabbath. And what's interesting is that first fruits is a Sunday. And when you count down to 50 days, it's going to be a Sunday. It's got first, first day of the week is going to be the first day of the week in the third month of the Jewish year. We have studied all of that. I'm just doing a review. We have studied all of that. This is our fifth lesson in this series. And... You can't jump in the middle of this and really understand all this. You really need to go back and stay with us through the study of this. This is our fifth lesson in this series called Messianic Holidays or Passovers. So what we've tried to do during this month, we've tried to take these Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost, to show you the fulfillment of Matthew 5.17, 1 
Romans 10, 4, Luke 24, 44, 49, that Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. And he must fulfill it by rules and regulations of the festivals, and we've studied them. He has to fulfill them. Last week, we studied how he fulfilled Pentecost. Most people don't realize all about Pentecost, which was called the Feast of Weeks under the Old Testament holiday. And so where we are today, we're following up from last week's Pentecost. And after a word of prayer, we're going to come back and review just quickly Pentecost to bring us where we are today. Notice that our lesson is called the Holy Spirit's Baptism. The Holy Spirit's Baptizing. And that's going to be really important to our lesson today. <clears throat> Let us pray. Well, here it is. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality, evidence of carnality in the church age. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitudes, sin, sins of the tongue, diverse sins. What must you do to get out of carnality and back to spirituality in the Christian life because the Holy Spirit indwells every believer in the church age, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. So how do I get out of carnality and back to spirituality so that the ministry of the Holy Spirit can have an impact upon my life? First John 1, I'd have to confess my sin. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. The cleansing is extended from verse 7 where Christ dies on the cross. He sheds his blood for the remission of sin. That's applied to my life, not as an unbeliever anymore, but as a believer. It applied to my life as an unbeliever at salvation. It applies to my life in, as a Christian in spirituality. When I confess my sin, I'm, I'm brought back into spirituality through the blood of Christ. That's very important you understand that. We're going to have a word of prayer to give you an opportunity to confess sin before Bible study. For the Holy Spirit is the, John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit teaches and recalls. I want you to be sure that you get the maximum out of this hour of Bible study with us. Let us pray. I give you a moment of silence. Well, Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us on this great Easter holiday of April. And we have studied Passover and how Jesus fulfilled it on the cross. We have studied unleavened bread and how Jesus fulfilled it both by burial and resurrection. And we've looked at Pentecost Jesus, seated at the right hand of God the Father, baptized with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And the church was born. We thank you, Father, for that. We pray you would teach us today about the Holy Spirit's ministry of baptism. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to get, begin to say to you uh, uh, a principle Pentecost in 30 AD, the one that's connected with Jesus Christ, was to the doctrine of the birth of the church what the birth of Christ is to the doctrine of incarnation. Pentecost. Pentecost was to the doctrine of the birth of the church what the birth of Jesus Christ was to the doctrine of the incarnation of Christ, Christ coming into the world. They're both significant importance, and Jesus is, a, Jesus is the key to both of them. Because people don't understand the Jewish holidays in a proper way, they miss the importance of Pentecost was an event that Jesus had to fulfill, and how he fulfilled it and what that means to the church that was born on that day. We studied that at Pentecost, and if you want more about, more about that, that's last Sunday's lesson. Last Sunday, we learned that Jesus baptized believers gathered at the Feast of the Weeks in 30 AD called Pentecost to the Christian. 
with the Holy Spirit by fulfilling the Messianic prophecies. And I, I laid them all out to you last week. But just, for example, Matthew 3.11 and Acts 1, 4, and 5, where John the Baptist, after 400 years, came to the nation of Israel as a prophet, and they all knew that, and he prophesied about Jesus. He identified him to be, he identified Christ to be Jesus of Nazareth, and he declared that he would baptize with the Holy Spirit. He said, I came to baptize in water. He comes to baptize in the Holy Spirit. Where did that happen? Where did it happen? Because it never happened in his earthly ministry. Where did that happen? Where Jesus baptized with the Holy Spirit. It happened at Pentecost. It happened at Pentecost. Matthew 2, 32 and 33. This Jesus God raised up again in which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, that's ascension session, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this promise of the Holy Spirit, Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit, which you both see and hear. That was the rushing winds and speaking in tongues to Jews who had gathered for the Feast of the Weeks to close out this enormous ceremony of Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and now Pentecost to close that whole event up. This series of lessons has been important for every church age believer to understand the difference between Jesus baptizing believers, Jewish believers, Jewish believers at Pentecost in 30 AD with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. From the Holy Spirit baptizing believers, both Jews and Gentiles, into Christ and into his body, the church. These are completely different, yet they're tied together. Jesus gave us an awareness of this in the book of John in the seventh chapter, 37 to 39, when he talked about the Holy Spirit would come and he would reside inside the body and become an artesian well. He talked about it again in John 14, 15, and 16 to his disciples and this is now going to occur once he's exalted, ascended and exalted, sitting on the throne at the right hand of God the Father, the first official authoritative act was to establish the church by baptizing all the Jewish people from all over the world who had gathered at this enormous festival period of the coming of the Messiah. Let me talk to you today about four ideas about the Holy Spirit's baptism. Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost in 30 AD was the introduction of the Advent ministry of the Holy Spirit into the church age of the New Covenant. Now, that's a whole lot, and I want to do it again. I want you to be sure you understand this importance. Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost in 30 AD was the introduction of the advent of the ministry of the Holy Spirit into the church age of the new covenant. Jesus prepared his disciples for this in John 14, 15, and 16. He prepared him once again in the book of Acts, the first chapter, before he left the earth and ascended back to the Father to be seated at the right hand of God the Father with his first official act to baptize the Jewish believers with the Holy Spirit. At the Last Supper of Luke 22, 20, Jesus said at the Last Supper, his Last Supper, and in the same way, he took the cup, and after they had eaten the bread, 
that's old, that's Passover bread, saying, this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood, rather than animal, the perfect lamb, perfect at growth and death. Did you hear that? He said, this cup is going to be changed forever. This cup that represented Old Covenant, Passover lamb of Exodus 12, the blood on the house secured, secured the people in it. As believers who believed and put the blood of Christ on the doorpost. You do know that, don't you? We celebrate the Eucharist in 1 Corinthians 11, 25. We celebrate the Eucharist in regard to that whole program. What a ha the fulfillment of Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. That's what we celebrate in the Eucharist, the fulfillment of all that. You do understand that, don't you? Go back and study. You may have to study my five lessons several times to get this. You will probably never hear this anywhere else. Outside of doctrinal, categorical preaching pastors. Listen to John 14, 26. Well, listen to John 16, 5 through 7 first. And now I am going to him, God, Jesus speaking. Now I am going to him. He's telling the disciples he's going somewhere. I'm going to God who sent me. And yet none of you ask, where are you going? But because I have said these things, I am going from you. Sorrow has filled your hearts. But I tell you the truth, doctrinal statement. It is to your advantage. Get that word. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, going back to heaven, the helper, John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. You know when he did that? Pentecost. Pentecost is when he sent the Holy Spirit in. It established the church age of the new covenant through the blood of Christ. It's to your advantage to know this. It is your security in Christ. The ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is the great ministry to the Christian church, exists between Pentecost and the rapture. We call that the church age. You do know that, don't you? You do know that. <laughs> well, you do know that now. You do know that now. Because I just taught it. Here is John 14, 16. Now listen to this. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. It is interesting, in the Greek language, they had two words for another. They had one word called alas, which meant another of the same kind. And they had another word that meant similar but different. For example, fruit, one of the same kind, would be uh, an apple. Maybe a lot of varieties, but it's an apple. As opposed to, that'd be alas, as opposed to heteros, that's an orange, not an apple. They're both fruit, but that's an orange, and that's not an apple. That's an orange. That's an apple. They're not the same. They're part of fruit, but they're, not, they're different. <laughs> the word that he used there was alas, referring to him. I am one comforter. I'm going to go. It's to your advantage 
that you allow the second comforter, the other comforter, the third member of the Godhead, to replace me in your life. In that way, I'm going to indwell you. I'm going to live with you. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to be, I'm going to be your spiritual guide on. You do know that, don't you? If you don't, you haven't found the secret to the dynamic Christian life. That's why you're struggling so much in your spiritual life. Up and down, you're like a yo-yo. Never consistent. You don't know this. You don't know it. John 14, 16. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, a paracletus, and he, that he, the other comforter, may be with you in dwelling, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Listen to this, forever. Except the Greek language doesn't actually say forever here. It actually says, Eistonion. It refers to the church age. This is the Holy Spirit's indwelling, powerful ministry in the life of the believer, church age believers. That's what that says. Point number two. Three very important things happened at Pentecost in 30 AD that affects the Christian way of life on earth during the church age affects your life and mine. You suppose that be important for you to get a pencil and paper and write this down if you didn't pick up our notes? DoctrinalStudies.com, you can pick up the notes. But if you haven't picked up the notes, don't you suppose this would be important to you? Jesus says to his disciples, you know, I'm going away. And apparently it doesn't, it doesn't have any, sorrows filled your heart, but you don't ask me, where am I going and why? Here I am, I'm teaching like crazy to you, and you're not taking any of this serious. You're not writing it down, you're not looking it up. Look, you, there's no way you can stay up to speed with me when I'm going like lights out in an hour. Don't you think you ought to get a pencil and paper and write some of this down? If you think you know it, you're in trouble. Arrogance over your spiritual thinking can be a very dangerous thing. So, here's number one. Jesus fulfilled the final messianic Jewish holiday. He fulfilled Passover, died on a cross, fulfilled unleavened bread, three days of burial. Raised on first fruit Sunday, now we got Pentecost. You understand that? Jesus fulfilled the final messianic holiday, Pentecost, which is associated with the first advent of Jesus Christ. The first three, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits, had to be fulfilled while Jesus was on earth. Then he would go away, and he would fulfill the final one that connects them all. He's got to do Pentecost, and he's got to do it God's way. He's got to send the Holy Spirit back, the other comforter, the other helper. You do know that, don't you? Well, you do now. Did you notice that Pentecost wasn't done on earth by Jesus? It was done in heaven. He was exalted, seated at the right hand of God the Father, and the first official act he did was Pentecost. John 16, 5 through 7. The second thing that's of importance. Jesus baptized Jewish Believers assembled. They were Jewish believers assembled from all different parts of the world 
He baptized them with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, 1 through 13. Study the whole thing. Listen to Acts 2, 33. Therefore, have been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he, Jesus Christ, seated at the right hand of God, has poured out this, that's the baptism, that Jesus baptized him with the Holy Spirit, this, which you both hear and see, which was the proof pudding of, with tongues. That's Isaiah 28, 11. Did you get that? This baptism would be associated because of Jews with the sign of tongues, 1 Corinthians 1, 22. Jews seek, Jews have to have a sign. Gentiles need wisdom. Listen, 1 Corinthians 14, 20, 21. Tongues. We're foreign believers. Tongues. We're speaking to, to unbelievers. Jews speaking with foreign tongues. Speaking in, uh, in, in Gentile languages to people that needed to hear the gospel. Isaiah 28, 11. Messianic fulfilled. Third. Listen, this may shake your world a little bit. If it does, it's because you've got some false thinking in there. Go back to the Bible. What's the Bible say? What's the Bible say? What does all of it say? Now, you just don't cherry pick it. What does it all say? And what's the conclusion? When you study all of it, what's the conclusion? Stop cherry picking the word of God. Let it change your life and your theology forever. Thus saith the Lord. The third thing is Jesus' baptism by the Holy Spirit incorporated these dispersed Jews into one body of Christ, the church. Those assembled. These are the dispersed Jews all over the world. This is one of the three holidays they saved up all their money to make the trip. And this was especially good because of the time of the season. Good weather. Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit incorporated them into the body of Christ, the church, Acts 2, 29 through 36. Listen to Acts 2, 41. <laughs> Listen to this. So then... Those who have received his, Peter speaking, his word, Peter's preaching. So then those who had received his word, Peter's preaching, were baptized. Now watch this. And that day there was added about 3,000 souls. Added to whom? We're talking about 3,000 people. 3,000 souls got saved. Added to whom? I mean, these are people being added to whom? This is Pentecost. This is Pentecost. And we have 3,000 people and the advent of the Holy Spirit. We have 3,000 people added to whom? Acts 1.15, the 120 believers 
at Pentecost. That day, the 120 and the 3,000 were added, added to the 120, and they were all incorporated into the church. This is the day of the birth of the church, and it began with 3,000 plus the 120. That's a pretty good day. Oh, you say, Ron. Well, listen. The Bible goes on in the book of Acts, in the second chapter 47, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day. Whose number? The 120 that now had become 1,120. The church. They're talking about the church. People are being added to the church daily. I'm still in Acts 2. By the time we get to Acts 4, it has grown to 5,000. And when we continue to read Acts 5, 14, 6, 1, and 7, 9th chapter 31, 35, 32, the 11th chapter 21, 24, the 14th chapter 1, the 16th, 21 and 21, chapter 16, verse 5, 17, 12, they're still adding to the church. Come on. Come on, people. They're being added. To what? The church. The 120 became 3,120, became 5,000, and then it just got crazy. But people have still been added, and here I am, here you are. We've been added to the body of Christ, the church. I'm telling you where it began. I'm telling you how it began. I'm telling you everything about it. It's called the book of Acts. You did know all this, didn't you? Well, you do now. Here's point three. Starting with Pentecost, the Holy Spirit does eight works once a person believes the gospel that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and on the third day raised from the dead. When you believe that, you're saved. The sinner prayer is the one you pray to God and thank him. I don't know what your sinner prayer is. I know you're a sinner, and I know you need to be saved. I can't give you a sinner's prayer. You give it yourself. You tell God. I believe that Jesus died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead. Then what else do you want to tell him? You tell him. That's your sinner's prayer. You tell him that he saved you by grace. The moment you believe, Romans 1.16, he saves you by grace through faith, not of yourself as a gift of God, Acts, I mean, Ephesians 2.8.9. The sinner's prayer should be to tell him that stuff as much as you can understand. He rescued you. You were the perishing. You were on your way to hell, and he rescued you. The gospel rescued you. Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God to save everyone who believes. It happened to me that way, and if you're saved, it happened to you. He does eight works based on the gospel. The moment you believe it, he does eight works. He does adoption, baptism. That's what we're talking about, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling, regenerates, sanctification, seals and earnest spiritual life and spiritual gifts. All of these eight things are the work of the Holy Spirit. Boom, the moment. You know why? Because Jesus sent him to do this work. Pentecost is when Jesus sent him to do this work. It is the advent, the church is, is the advent of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. And all of the passages, I gave you passages, I didn't quote them. I'm limited in my time. I've got so much to tell you. But if you'll pick up the papers, I gave you scriptures of evidence.
the most anybody's heard about all this work is regeneration. And sometimes they don't even connect it with the Holy Spirit. They talk about regeneration apart from the Holy Spirit. You ought to read Titus, Titus 3, 4 through 7. I'm just telling you, this is the day in which we live. We live in the church age, began at Pentecost. The church age is of the new covenant. It is the great ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I'm afraid the church doesn't even know him. And he lives in the house with them and doesn't, they don't even know him. That shouldn't surprise me as a pastor. There are a lot of people who go to church that don't know anybody who goes to church with them. But if there's any spiritual activity in your life, not religious, any spiritual activity in your life, it's because of the Holy Spirit, who's called spiritual. All. If you're spiritual, it's because of the Holy Spirit. Take the word and you got nothing. If you take the word spirit out of spiritual, you've got nothing. You got you all. That's what you got. Here's my final point. Aren't you glad? This is my final point. Have I not shook your world up? Huh? How was it you didn't know all this? Maybe this is one of the good things of COVID-19. I caught you home. <laughs> I caught you home. You know how many pastoral visits I would knock on a door, even if they were home, they weren't home. <laughs> I caught you home, didn't I? What a good day in your life this will be for you if you listen to the Word of God. This, this, this lesson would change your life. And the other, the other four lessons, oh, my goodness. Would you study those? It will so revolutionize your life. It will transform you. Now, here's my final point. Hooray. The baptism of the Holy Spirit does two important works at the moment of salvation of Christian life. The baptism, you know, there's regeneration, baptism, adoption. There are a lot of things. Baptism of the Holy Spirit does two very important things. Boy, don't miss this. And it's done by the grace of God at the moment you believe the gospel. The gospel is what gives you these. When you believe the gospel that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, when you believe that, the Holy Spirit does two things for you immediately under the title, baptized by the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to on a piece of paper, if you didn't have our study guide, if you got a study guide, it's on it. But if you don't, I want you to put a cross on your paper. You got to put the cross on your paper, right, like that. Draw a line down like this, and then go straight up and put an arrow on it. That represents Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, being buried, and being raised from the dead. That is the gospel. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. That's Romans 1, 6, 16. That's Romans 1, 16. That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Boom. You got that? Did you write that down? Well, okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Put a cross on your paper. Draw a line down. And then straight up and put a, a line on it. Put a hook on it, you know, an arrow. Underneath it, write 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. That's the gospel. Romans 1.16, that's what you have to do to be saved. Ephesians 2.8.9, that's your security passage of being saved. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift. You got that? Now here's what I want you to do. At the base of the cross, at the base of the cross, you know, we, at the foot of the cross, you know, I live at the foot of the cross. You should. You ought to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. But at the foot of the cross, draw a line up like that and put a circle. 
go back to the foot of the cross, draw another line over, and put another circle beneath the other circle. At the foot of the cross. <laughs> Come on now. At the foot of the cross, draw a line up. There's a top circle. Put it up there. Come back to the foot of the cross and draw another one down. We have now a bottom circle. On the line that goes up to the top circle, put BHS, baptism of the Holy Spirit. On the line to the bottom circle, put BHS, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, just do it. Top circle, outside the top circle, write Galatians 3.27. And on the bottom circle, outside the circle, write 1 Corinthians 12, 13. <laughs> All right. All right. Listen. Top circle, outside the circle, write Galatians, uh, Galatians 3, 27. Bottom circle, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Good. Yeah. In the top circle... Right in Christ. In the top, inside the top circle, right in Christ. In the bottom circle, right in the body of Christ, or in church. Either way you want to do it. Either in the body of Christ. In the body of Christ, the church. Because when you, the moment you are saved, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into union with Christ. We call that positional sanctification in theology. Positional sanctification in Christ, like 2 Corinthians 5.17, 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man be in Christ, in him, that's positional. He is a new creation. That's what we're talking about. We call, we call that positional sanctification, being set aside into God's holiness Life. Down here in the bottom circle with 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we're talking about membership in the church. He baptizes you into the body of Christ. You become a member. You become a member of the body of Christ. Paul talks about that. Now listen to me. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. You're a part of the body of Christ. You don't join it. It joins you. Now, let's take our Bibles and let's look at Galatians, the third chapter, and then we'll close. The third chapter, verse 27. I'm going to start with verse 26, if you don't mind. For we, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That is the gospel. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, that's baptism of the Holy Spirit, who have been baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. Everything that he is, you become in him. He's a son, you're a son. The, the, these are all what we call status privileges of union with Christ in our little pamphlet you can get 50 things you can never lose in time and eternity about your salvation here I am for you are all did it say some mm -mm, all when when I put my faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ and was saved, for all of you who are baptized in Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. He's a, he's a son, I'm a son. He's eternal life, I'm eternal life. He's an heir, I'm an heir. He's a priest, I'm a priest. And so it goes on. Now listen to verse 28. As a result of being baptized into Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek in the body of Christ. There is neither slave nor free in the body of Christ. There is neither male nor female in the body of Christ because you are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all 
in Christ, we are all Christians. We are ones that belong to Christ. And we have lost in the body of Christ, we have lost all of the social hang-ups. Whether they're racial or social or educational, whatever. My point, we were baptized into Christ. That's top circle. Now let's go, go back a little bit, and let's go to 1 Corinthians 12, 13. It, it is in verse 4 that Paul says, there are a variety of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit, variety of ministries that go with the spiritual gift, but the same Lord, in verse 6, variety of performances, but the same God who works all things in all. Then he begins a discussion about the Holy Spirit's responsibility with spiritual gifts. And I want to drop down to verse 12, where he introduces us into the incorporate body of Christ, the church. And he talks about us all being parts of the one body. And he's referring to spiritually gifted ministries. But I'm after the fact that we're all one in the body of Christ. For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. Now watch verse 13. For by one spirit, Holy Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free. We were all made to drink of one spirit. You know where all that became possible? Pentecost. A new day. A new covenant. A new day. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit dwells inside our body, and our bodies become the temple of God. And you act like big deal. It's the biggest deal of any deal on earth. It bothers me. It's the church of Jesus Christ gives such little accent to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. It is what the church is all about, or it's about nothing. If it's not about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, it's about nothing. Because either you walk in the Spirit or you walk in the flesh. If you walk in the flesh, it's for nothing. Galatians 5.16. It is my prayer that these five lessons put together will help you understand the dynamics of what Christ did and why he left and what he sent back. That gives the dynamics to our life as Christians. You did know that, didn't you? <laughs> what do you do now? Our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us. They'll have to study some more, too. They'll have to let the Holy Spirit teach them instead of letting all the other goofiness teach them. They'll have to let the Word of God teach their souls to separate them from false thinking into spiritual truth. It's my desire, Father, the Holy Spirit would do that. It's not my intent to do it. My intent is to teach the truth. It's the responsibility of the Holy Spirit to bring truth to reality in the life of a person so that he has confidence in it. And I pray for that to be done in the life of these people that are listening, taking notes, studying for truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The words of Jesus from John 8.32.
we close in Jesus' name. Amen.